Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass in which we will explain how to perform a lower limbs examination. Start by washing your hands, introducing yourself, confirming the patient's details, explaining the examination to gain informed consent, offer a chaperone, adequately expose the patient and position the patient at 45 degrees and explain that you may need to lie them down during the examination. Ensure that you've got the required equipment that includes a tendon hammer, a neuro tip, a tuning fork, as well as uh, cotton wool. The principles of the neurological examination involve a thorough inspection followed by examination of tone, power, reflexes, coordination, sensation, and then gait. The key is to determine whether signs are arising from upper motor neuron lesions or lower motor neuron lesions. Upper lesions will arise from central nervous system disease and lower motor neuron lesions will arise from peripheral nervous system disease. Or a combination of both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs may be elicited from damage to both central and peripheral nervous system components. The key features to distinguish upper and lower motor neuron signs include by inspection, you'll note fasciculations in lower motor neuron conditions, which will not be present in upper motor neuron signs, and you'd notice marked muscle wasting with lower motor neuron conditions with little or disuse atrophy seen in upper motor neuron signs. Tone becomes hypertonic or increased in upper motor neuron signs or, and decreased in lower motor neuron signs. Power is found to demonstrate pyramidal weakness in upper motor neuron signs, that is to say that the extensors are weaker in the upper limbs and the flexors are weaker in the lower limbs. Whereas in lower motor neuron signs, there's a focal pattern of weakness with only the muscles directly innervated by the damaged neurons being affected. In an upper motor neuron sign, you may not have pronated drift and you'd not expect that with lower motor neuron signs. The reflexes also show characteristic changes. The deep tendon reflexes become hyperreflexic, as well as the demonstration of clonus in upper motor neuron conditions, whereas in lower motor neuron conditions, the deep tendon reflexes become hyporeflexic. The superficial reflexes are lost in, the, uh, in upper motor neuron conditions and are preserved in lower motor neuron conditions. Importantly, from a lower limb point of view, a, an upper motor neuron lesion will result in an upgoing or extensor response of the hallux to stimulation, whereas you'll have an downgoing or equivocal plantar response in a lower motor neuron condition. And just remember that any motor neuron sign, uh, that uh, any lesion that occurs in the neural pathway above the anterior horn will result in an upper motor neuron sign, and any lesion that occurs from or after the anterior horn of the spinal cord will result in a lower motor neuron sign. Start by inspecting by the bedside. Look for any mobility aids. Walking sticks and wheelchair may give you an indication of the patient's current mobility status and orthotic devices may indicate that the patient has a peripheral neuropathy or a foot drop indicating impaired mobility. If there are any visual uh, charts or prescriptions, examine them to give you an indi indication of the current status of the patient. On inspection, observe for any muscle wasting. Marked wasting is seen with lower motor neuron conditions and fasciculations are small local involuntary contractions and relaxations which may be visible under the skin and these are associated with lower motor neuron co conditions. A tremor may be present at rest or uh, an intention tremor when the patient makes a purposeful movement and there are a number of etiologies that could cause this. Choreoform movements are brief, irregular movements that are not repetitive or rhythmic, but appear to flow from one muscle group to the next, and this can be seen in patients with Huntington's disease. Hypomimia is a reduced uh, degree of facial expression associated with Parkinson's disease. Also observe for any scars, which may provide a clue of previous spinal axillary or limb surgery. Following a thorough inspection, move on to examine the tone in the lower limbs. The tone should be examined in muscle groups of the hips, the knee, the ankle, and a comparison should be made on both sides. With the patient lying on the couch, roll each leg to assess the tone in the muscles responsible for the rotation of the hip. Lift the knee briskly off the bread and observe for movement of the leg. In patients with normal tone, the knee should rise while the heel remains in contact with the bed or couch. In patients with hypertonia, the heel will typically lift off the couch and you should make a comment about whether the tone is normal, increased, or reduced. And you describe that as normotonia, hypertonia, or hypotonia. Uh, 
also examine for ankle clonus. Ankle clonus is analogous to hypertonia. It results from a series of involuntary muscle contractions and relaxations that's associated with an upper motor neuron lesion. Position the patient's legs so that the knees and ankles are slightly flexed. Circumduct the ankle and then rapidly dorsiflex and partially avert the foot to stretch the gastrocnemius muscle. Keep the foot in this position and observe for clonus. Up to five beats of clonus is tolerable. Beyond this is classified as pathological. Determine if the tone is hypertonic, whether the patient exhibits spasticity or rigidity. Spasticity is velocity dependent. The faster the limb is moved, the worse or more marked is the hypertonia. Rigidity is velocity independent. Irrespective of the speed that the limb is moved at, the degree of hypertonia remains the same throughout. In spasticity, the initial movement is slowest due to the most marked increase in tone being at the beginning of the movement, described as clasp knife spasticity. In rigidity, there is uniform increase of tone throughout movement, and this is known as lead pipe rigidity. If there is a superimposed tremor, then this is known as cogwheel rigidity. After assessing the tone, examine the power in the muscle groups of the hips, knees, ankles on each leg, comparing each side. Score the power using the Medical Research Council scale, which has a scale of 0 to 5. 0 indicates no muscle contraction, 1 is a flicker of contraction, 2 is active movement along gravity, 3 is active movement against gravity, 4 is active movement against gravity and resistance, and 5 is normal power. To examine the power in the hips, hip flexion, which is done by the iliopsoas muscle innervated by the iliofemoral nerve, ask the patient to raise their leg off the bed, applying downward pressure over the anterior thigh. Hip extension, which is done through the gluteus maximus muscle innervated by the sciatic nerve, place your hand underneath the thigh and ask them to resist you lifting their leg up. Power in the knees, knee flexion and extension, knee flexion, which is done through the posterior thigh muscles innervated by the sciatic nerve, ask the patient to flex their knee so that their foot is flat on the bed and apply resistance by pulling the lower leg towards you, asking the patient to resist. Knee extension, which is uh, done through the quadriceps innervated by the femoral nerve, ask the patient while the knee is still flex, position your hand over the anterior portion of the lower leg and ask the patient to try and straighten out their leg against your resistance. Examine the ankles for dorsiflexion and eversion. The muscles responsible for this is the tibialis anterior muscle, which is innervated by the deep perineal nerve. Ask the patient to position their legs flat on the bed, dorsiflex their foot, and resist you trying to push their foot downwards, and then ask the patient to evert their foot. Ankle plantar flexion and inversion, which is mediated through the gastrocnemius muscle innervated by the tibial nerve. In order to examine this, ask the patient to plantar flex their foot and resist you trying to pull their foot upwards. Also ask the patient to invert their ankle. You can also examine the power in the big toe. The muscle involved is the extensor hallucis longus, which is innervated by the deep perineal nerve, ask the patient to extend the big toe and resist you pushing it down. The key is to determine whether power is normal or whether there is a loss of power in an upper motor neuron fashion or a lower motor neuron fashion. With upper motor neuron lesions, there is a pyramidal weakness where the extensors are weaker in the upper limbs, but the flexors are weaker in the lower limbs. If there's a lower motor neuron signs of power, there would be focal pattern of weakness with only the muscles directly innervated by the damaged neurons and nerves being affected. Move on to examine the reflexes. Explain to the patient that you will examine their reflexes by tapping on their legs in various positions with a tendon hammer. The leg needs to be relaxed for an accurate response to be elicited. Hold the tendon hammer towards the end to allow gravity to facilitate a good swing. If a reflex appears absent, you can ensure uh, that the patient is fully relaxed and then perform the, uh, a maneuver called the gendrastic maneuver to help reinforce uh, the reflex. And this is done by asking the patient to clench their teeth together while you simultaneously tap the tendon. The three key reflexes that need to be tested in the lower limbs is the knee jerk reflex. 
which is mediated through L3 and L4. Support the knee so that it is relaxed completely. Tap the patella tendon with a tendon hammer just below the patella and this stretches the muscle spindle in the quadriceps muscle. If a reflex appears absent, you can offer to reinforce with a gendrastic maneuver. The ankle jerk reflex, which is mediated through S1, is tested by first supporting the leg so that the hip is slightly abducted, the knee is flexed and the ankle is dorsiflexed. Tap the Achilles tendon with a tendon hammer and observe for a contraction in the gastrocnemius muscle associated with plantar flexion of the foot. The plantar reflex, which is mediated through L5 and S1, is tested by ensuring that the patient is lying on the couch and a blunt object is used to scrape the lateral edge of the sole of the foot and then towards the big toe. Observe for a flexion of the toes. This is a normal response. An abnormal or Babinski positive response is where there is an extension of the big toe and a spread of the other toes, and this is suggestive of an upper motor neuron lesion. So here is a reminder that the reason we're testing reflexes is to determine whether they're normal or abnormal, and if they're abnormal, are there upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron signs? The deep tendon reflexes become hyperreflexic with clonus in upper motor neuron conditions and hyporeflexive in lower motor neuron conditions. And the Babinski sign is positive, demonstrated by an upgoing or extensor response of the hallux in response to stimulation in an upper motor neuron condition and is equivocal or downgoing or a flexor response in a lower motor neuron condition. Move on to examine sensation in a dermatomal distribution comparing the left and the right leg. There are five key points you should examine to help individually assess dermatomes of L1 through to S1 in order. L1 can be tested by applying sensation to the groin region. L2 can be tested by examining the lateral aspect of the thigh. L3, the medial aspect of the knee. L4, the medial ankle. L5, the big toe, and L6, the dorsum of the little toe. Examine by first placing the sensory object over the sternum to make sure that the patient can appreciate normal sensation, and then ask the patient to close their eyes as you test the various dermatomes and ask them to ensure if the sensation appears normal or abnormal, and, and compare the left and the right. Examining pain and temperature will allow you to assess the spinothalamic tract and assessing light touch and vibration will allow you to examine the dorsal columns. Pinprick or pain or temperature is used to examine spinothalamic tracts and you can use the sharp end of a neurotip to examine. Vibration assesses the dorsal columns and a 128 hertz tuning fork is used first placed on the sternum to ensure they can appreciate the vibration rather than the cold temperature of the instrument and if they can the tuning fork is then placed on the interphalangeal joint of the patient's big toe and then the eyes are closed and you ask them to appreciate when the vibration begins and stops. If they're unable to accurately uh, discern this then you can move the tuning fork more proximally, sequentially starting at the metatarsophalangeal joint of the big toe, the ankle joint, the knee joint, the hip joint, until the patient is able to identify the vibration accurately, and the left and right should be compared. Another way to test the dorsal columns is through proprioception or joint position sensing. Begin by assessing proprioception at the interphalangeal joint of the big toe by holding the distal phalanx of the big toe by its sides and moving the toe up and down. Ask the patient to close their eyes and as you move the big toe up and down, ensure that they're able to correctly identify if the big toe is moving upwards or downwards. If the patient is unable to uh, accurately joint position sense, sequentially assess more proximal joints, starting with the metatarsophalangeal joint of the big toe, the ankle joint, the knee joint, and the hip joint. Remember, sensory pathology can present in a number of ways. Mononeuropathies result in localized sensory disturbance in the area supplied by the damaged nerve. Peripheral neuropathy tends to cause symmetrical sensory deficits in a glove and stocking distribution, whereas a radiculopathy which occurs due to nerve root damage, for example by compression of a herniated intervertebral disc, will result in a sensory disturbance in a dermatomal pattern.
If the spinal cord itself is damaged, that will lead to a sensory level where at the level of the uh, dermatome and below, the sensation is impaired. And cortical lesions will result in loss of sensation in a homunculus pattern. Move on to examine coordination. The heel to shin test is a good way of assessing lower limb coordination. Ask the patient to place their left heel over their right knee, run it along their shin in a straight line and ask them to repeat that movement. If this is impaired or they're dysmetric, then this would suggest potential ipsilateral cerebellar pathology. After assessing coordination, move on to examine the patient's gait. The patient should be accompanied very closely Ask the patient to walk to the end of the room, turn and walk back. Observe each phase of gait, including the turn phase, and then ask them to walk back. The stance can give an idea of any pathology. A broad-based ataxic gait is usually associated with cerebellar disease. If the patient is staggering and they have a slower and steady gait, that again could be cerebellar disease. If the patient veers to one side, then usually that's the side of the cerebellar disease. Ex observe the patient's arm swing. Absent or reduced arm swing can be noted in Parkinson's disease. Usually it's typically unilaterally and then can progress to bilateral reduced arm swing. The stepping cycle, if there are small shuffling steps that can be associated with Parkinson's disease, a high stepping gait may indicate the presence of foot drop and if a patient has difficulty turning, a slow turn with multiple steps may be as a result of Parkinson's disease or as a result of cerebellar disease. Tandem gait or heel to toe gait is another important way to help determine cerebellar pathology. This in particular, if the patient is unable to tandem gait, could indicate cerebellar vermis dysfunction. There are several gait abnormalities to be aware of. The ataxic, broad-based and steady gait with veering is suggestive of cerebellar disease. Proprioceptive sensory ataxia, which is where patients are typically watching their feet intently, can be uh, suggestive of sensory ataxia. A Parkinsonian gait, where small shuffling steps, a stoop posture, reduced arm swing with a festinating gait is suggestive of Parkinson's. A hemiparetic gait, where one leg is held stiffly and swings round in an arch, or a also known as a circumduction gait, usually results from a stroke affecting the lower limbs. Spastic paraparesis, which is similar to a hemiparetic gait but bilateral, where both legs are stiff and circumducting, and the patient's feet may be inverted and scissor, is associated with hereditary spastic paraplegia. Perform Romberg's test, and this is used to assess for loss of proprioceptive function in sensory ataxia. This does not assess cerebellar function, but is there to help distinguish non-cerebellar cause of balance issues. Position yourself next to the patient, ready to support them in case they fall. Ask the patient to put their feet together and keep their arms by their side, and ask the patient to close their eyes. If when the patient closes their eyes, they become markedly unsteady or fall, this is a positive Romberg sign, suggestive that the unsteadiness is due to sensory ataxia, i.e. a defect in proprioceptive or vestibular function rather than cerebellar function. And there are a number of causes of this, including vitamin B12 deficiency, Parkinson's disease and aging. And this uh, is known as press by propria. Having examined the gait, this would complete the examination thank the patient and explain to them that the examination has been completed and offer further assessments and investigations including a full neurological examination and suggest relevant neuro investigations and a management plan. Thank you very much for attending this Medicine Masterclass.